remember Brother Jim and Sister Sandy. Remember Brother Gary and his help. Remember Sister Rosa. Remember Brother Randy and Sister Laura. Remember Sister Marlene and her help. Remember Brother Gene and Sister Judy. Remember Sister Ollie and Aunt Dorothy. Remember Sister Nina Williams. Remember Sister Judy's building drug prayers. Remember Dave Swindler and his recovery. Remember Jenny Witt doing much better now. Linda Parks in remission from stage four cancer. Remember Sister Barb Burr. Remember Lori's sister Linda. Remember Sandy's daughter, Bo. Remember Sister Diane's grandson, Alexander, the board of his niece. And remember Gary's neighbor and friend, Gail, needs our prayers. Anybody else have a request? Yes, I do. I have a request for a gentleman named Dustin. Dustin Martin. He is my son-in-law's brother, and um, he started out that summer. He has a spot on for him, and um, it's sort of spread now. He has a spot on his mind. He's been taking care of it since he started, but uh, he, he's not doing very well in the process. He's diabetic, so his blood sugar goes low.
Um, we did the most important part today. Well, not the most important part. We did the business part. I got that. I had a little note up here to make sure I did that. But to go back, last week, our basic message had one item on the menu, and that being the Holy Spirit. A lot of people don't understand how crippled the Old Testament people were compared to us. Now, they could go to the temple, or they could go to the tabernacle in the wilderness, whichever, go to the priest uh, there, uh, the high priest, and uh, they could get a prayer sent up. Uh, they could go in and uh, tell the priest that they had sinned, and the priest would tell them, well, this is what you got to do. Be a you got to make this sacrifice or whatever. And uh, they could get that taken care of. But you see, they had to go. And they didn't know what was going to happen. Sister Linda, I don't have to go. If I have if I have a question that I need God to answer wherever I am. I mean, I, I can be driving down Interstate 71. 75 miles, well, 65 miles an hour. Better say that, better do that. 65 miles an hour. And if I have a question I need God to answer, I, can pull over. I don't even have to pull over, really. I keep my eyes open focus on the road, and I can just mention it to him right then and right there, and he's got it. The Old Testament saints had to go down to the tabernacle in the wilderness, or had to go down to the temple, or had to go to one of the synagogues and find the priest and, you know, go through all of that stuff. I'm just so happy, Brother Jim, I don't have to. Plus, if they had a, a thought that they couldn't put together with the word, they were kind of stuck because there was nothing in between. I don't know for sure, I'm, I'm certain most of you at least, someplace along the line, a question came up and you knew the answer to it, but you didn't know where to find the answer to it here. So you asked the Lord about it, and in a song, in a preached message, in conversation with somebody else, somehow, somewhere in a concordance, in a dictionary, you got that answer. But the Holy Spirit was the one that sent you to wherever it was, sent you to get that, hear that priest's message, sent you to hear that song, sent that person to bring the message to you, told you where the concordance or the dictionary was. It was the Holy Spirit that moved you in that direction. So we've got knowledge over here, the Word over here, and the Holy Spirit in the middle, putting the two together. I feel, I really feel sorry, Sister Sandy, the Old Testament saints. They didn't have that. They had faith, praise God. They did have faith. And sometimes I wonder if my faith is as strong as some of theirs was. I know it's not as strong as some of theirs was. My faith has never been strong enough to um, go out and start cutting down trees and building the boat in case it rains. Uh, Lori and I, we were talking about that. Or no, Lori. Sister Linda and I, we were talking about that this morning. About, uh, well, you know, your prayers do get answered. Yeah. I feel sometimes like Noah that first day, you know, God told him it was going to rain. He started cutting down trees. But it was 100 years before it rained. I sometimes feel like Noah on that first day. But God does reach out through the Holy Spirit and give us instruction, gives us direction, gives us all of the things that we need to make all of this work, make our knowledge work, make our spiritual life work, the whole thing. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads, guides, directs, teaches, and I think, I, I tell you what, I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I don't I'm glad I wasn't born under the Old Testament. <laughs> Praise God. But uh, the other thing about the Holy Spirit is John the Baptist said that all would be baptized by Christ. There comes one mightier than I, the latch of whose shoes I'm not worthy to scoop and unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That was the other half of 
last week's message. We're going to be baptized one way or the other by Jesus Christ. Let's make sure it's by the Holy Spirit and not by fire. If it is by fire, it's going to be by their choice. But before we get to the Holy Spirit being involved in our lives, there is another item, another thing, another entity that we need to talk about, and that entity is prayer. So would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of your many blessings. We thank you most importantly for your son, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for those in the Old Testament who brought faith all the way up to Jesus, who brought good works all the way up to Jesus, who did, we call them being righteous, they weren't saved as we know of salvation, but they were righteous. And we thank you, Father, that they did bring righteousness up to Jesus Christ today. Not everybody did, but some of them did. We thank you for them. And we thank you, Father, for the disciples, for the apostles, for those who went on and shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your word that you've given us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Thessalonians, and so forth. Thank you, Father, for that word that tells us about Jesus, tells us about being a Christian, tells us about what we need to do. And uh, we just thank you, Father, that we are saved. But most importantly, Father, we thank you for this thing called prayer. This thing called prayer that allows us to reach out to you and even drive down the road. Have to pull over, we don't have to go find a priest driving down the road. If there's a prayer request that comes needed, we just thank you, Father, that you, that you take care of it and that you do. Thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. They all said, Amen. As we think about prayer, we have to also realize that prayer is an absolute important process. We're getting a person from lost as lost can be to saved as saved can be. Um, many people have the impression, if you ask them, was, uh, was Peter and James and Andrew and Matthew, were they all saved when Jesus was here? Um, were they born again? You ask people this question. And they'll tell you, oh yeah, yeah, they had to be in order to run around and hang around with Jesus. Well, let me tell you about that story for example for a minute. And part of that story goes to the very night that Jesus Christ had the last supper with his disciples. He had had the last supper, he was talking to them, and this was one of the things that he said. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. There are two important things to see here. The first one, of course, is Jesus prayed for Peter. Jesus prayed for Peter. That's that's something in itself. But the second thing is that Peter was not converted. Say now, Brother White, are you sure about that? Well, I'm not certain, but Jesus Christ said that he wasn't, so I think that will end the argument right then and right there. Peter, on the night Jesus was taken, during the Last Supper, while his feet were being washed by Jesus Christ, while they were having communion and foot washing, is what we call it, Peter was as lost as lost can be. He was not saved, as we know, being saved. Yes, he was, quote unquote, somewhat religious, and yes, he was hanging around with Jesus Christ. But if you stop and ask yourself, or if I ask you the question, do you, have you ever known anybody that was somewhat religious? that maybe came to church and maybe had their name on the roll book and yet they were lost as 
wash your feet. We've all known people like that. Yeah. On Sunday, we always thought they were saved and everything was right and everything was going fine. And then somewhere along the line, we found out that it really wasn't that way. That the whole thing was an act. And sometimes it's an act so that they can sell you insurance. Sometimes it's an act because dad's in the church, so son or daughter's got to be in the church. And sometimes it's just, well, you know, they got some good food down there every now and then. And I ain't doing nothing else on Sunday morning. I'm not for church. And some people are convinced that all it takes for salvation is to walk up and shake the preacher's hand. Let me tell you something, friends. It takes a little bit more than walking up and shaking the preacher's hand. I'm glad that people do. I love, I love it for somebody, Sister Linda. I'd be standing here waiting for somebody to come and pray. They just walk up and take me by the hand and say, pray for me. Turn around and walk back. That's fine with me. If that's all they'll do, I'm glad they do that. I'd like for them to say, Brother Dwight, pray with me. I'd like to get saved right now. <laughs> that's what we'd really like to see happen. But that doesn't always happen. But here, Peter was just a common, ordinary, run-of-the-mill lost man just like we were one day no, no difference we, how many of us went to church before we got saved Yeah, a lot of us did uh, I remember as a kid <laughs> in fact uh, I remember as a kid in grade school I got asked by some friends to go to the Lewis Center Methodist Church with them so I went up and we had Sunday school Oh, that was kind of fun. So I went the next Sunday. That was kind of fun. One of them said, now you make sure that you come next Sunday. And I said, why is that? So well, if you come three Sundays in a row, they'll make you a member. I didn't know why. See, this is the Holy Spirit part. I didn't know why. But I knew that wasn't right. I didn't go and ask my grandmother. I didn't know, go and ask mom. I just knew, Brother Gary, there was something that, you know, that was like chocolate chips or no chocolate chips. And, you know, it just wasn't right. There was something in there that didn't walk. I didn't go to church that next Sunday. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I didn't even go to church. Maybe I went up to Orange Friends Church. Uh, maybe, I don't know, I might have been crawling that time that Sunday morning. I don't know what I did. But I, didn't, I did not go to church that Sunday morning. I can tell you that for sure. Because, again, I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew that I wasn't going to be involved in it. There are so many different things that people do that make you think maybe they might be saved. And they really aren't. Peter hanging around with Jesus. Peter being the leader, so to speak. Uh, people today, if you ask them, do you think Peter was saved? Most people would say yes, he really was. Was he born again? Oh yes, he really was. But the truth of the matter is, if you want to see the proof there, all you have to do is go over to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we find that Jesus is dead, buried, resurrected. And in the very first part of Acts chapter 1, he's out there with them. And uh, they see him raise up. They see the angels standing there. And the angels said, why do you men stand gazing up here at the sky? That same Jesus you see that just went up, he's coming back in like manner. So they were enthusiastic, if you will, enthused or pushed towards, let's get something going here. Peter wanted to get something going. They had had 12 disciples all the time uh, once the group got together. Now, they only had left. Judas was dead. Judas had hung himself. So what did Peter the businessman do? He decided we've got to get this board of directors back together. We only got 11 on this board of directors. We've got to get 12. So he got them all together. And they got this one nominated. He got that one nominated. He said, okay, now let's vote. And they voted. They voted Matthias in. You think, it was, you think God was involved in that? No. Go through your entire New Testament. Read every word in your entire New Testament. You will never read the word of Matthias again. It was a man thing. God was not involved in it. If God had been involved in it, Matthias would have done 
was something. There might have been a book of Matthias, or there would be something later on in the book of Acts where Matthias did this or Matthias did that. Actually, that board of directors, so to speak, the 12 disciples, was filled by God later on. His name was Paul. Paul was a liar, a thief, a murderer. God only knows what all Paul was. But I'll tell you what else Paul was. He was forgiven. <laughs> yes, he was. He was forgiven for all the things that he did. But uh, when we look at that, talking about Jesus praying for Peter, and many times again we, we think of him being saved when he really wasn't, we also have to remember that Jesus prayed for Peter when Jesus could have demanded of Peter to straighten up his life. But you see, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus respects that line of a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. Jesus respects that line of free will choice. Free will choice. It is the free will choice of every man, every woman, every boy, every girl to either become a Christian or not. That's their choice. Jesus, God the Father, neither one will ever force someone to get saved. And that brings up a quick little point there, just, just a little prayer point I want to share with you, is don't pray, God, save my son. God, make my daughter get saved. Don't pray that. Pray that God the Father, Jesus Christ, Please put roadblocks in their way of living right now. Give them a reason to get saved. Give them a reason to get converted. Give them a reason, a desire, a hope to change the way they're living. Because when they make the change, they'll be glad they made the change. When they make the change, they'll see that they did it. And they'll work on keeping it that way. One of the things that uh, occurred when I got saved, I uh, came home from Kentucky, my wife and I did. I got saved Christmas night down in Kentucky at a little old hillbilly church about half the size of this one. And, uh, 21 people there that night, 14 of them was me and her and the rest of her family. Three of us got saved that night. I came home and I shared it with some uh, some people that I knew were Christians. And one of the things that uh, Brother Gene kind of broke my heart in a way was I shared it with one person that I really thought a lot of. And that person, all they said was, well, I hope it's okay. It's okay. You got to pray it's okay. You got to be glad. You got, got to be something. Well, I hope it's okay. God did not force me to get saved. I got saved. And I have to admit to a certain extent that that statement that was made did kind of push me a little bit to make sure that it did stick. And has stuff. <laughs> that was December 25th, 1977, and uh, it's kind of stuck ever since. But again, when we pray for our lost people, we need to pray for them. God, give them a good reason. You know, do something in their life to get them to change their way of living. You see, Jesus prayed for Peter, and there's a six-week time frame between the time that Jesus ascended up to heaven and the Holy Ghost came down in Acts chapter 2. There's a six-week time frame there. In that six-week time frame, Peter, James, John, Andrew, and the others that made up about 120 people, they were all kind of hanging out together. They did the finishing out the board of directors. They had that vote. 
But at the same time, the Lord was working on them. Giving them a reason that when it came time for them to accept the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they would. And they would accept it gladly, jump up and down, and rejoice. I can tell you, for, as a matter of fact, the happiest day of my life was that day standing up at that old-fashioned altar of prayer and walking back through the church knowing without a doubt no matter what happened I was on my way to heaven nothing could stop that and we had some joyful times telling some people I a few weeks later, or in fact several weeks later, I went to tell my grandmother. Grandma started praising the Lord, clapping her hands, crying and so forth there in the old nursing home. She fell asleep. And I thought, well, this is a good place. I, she's asleep. I don't want to see her cry when it's time for me to leave. I think I'll get my jacket on and just go ahead and leave while she's asleep. I reached over to get my jacket and put it on. She woke back up. And when she woke back up, she, she woke up right in the middle of the door all over again. She just kept right on going. <laughs> uh, but we had a grand time with that. Again, don't waste your time praying for somebody the wrong way. Pray the right way. And uh, while all of that's good teaching, there is one other thing I want to share with you this morning before we pray uh, today. This is found in John chapter 17, verse 20. Uh, the first part was found in the book of Luke. It's about the same time. This is a little bit later in the day. They have left the temple area. They have left the area where they had the Last Supper. Uh, they've left the area where they had uh, worship. They've gone up on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus begins to pray here in John chapter 17. When he gets down to verse 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone, meaning the disciples that were with him. Raise your hand here. <laughs> he says, But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Raise your hand because that's you. <laughs> that's a part of us. Praise God. That's, that's me, my friend. That's you. Jesus prayed for us. Now, I know some people will say, well, I've read that someplace else. There's a difference. Let me show you the difference here. The other place is right here, Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemned that is Christ that died, yea, rather than risen again? Who is he even at the right hand of God who also make an intercession for us? Those two different scriptures, one written by John, one written by Paul. The one written by Paul right here describes us today. Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Raise both hands and say, thank you, Lord. Yes, we're, we're glad for that. But that's us as Christians. We're saved. We're on our way to heaven. All he's doing is trying to help pave the way, you know. How many of you had a chuckle on your way to, way to church this morning, you know? Yeah, then <laughs> It's getting fun out there trying to dodge them things. In about three weeks, you won't be able to dodge them because the whole road is going to be one big chuck hole right down there. But that's beside the point. Jesus making intercession for us is to help us through the chuck holes of life. When Jesus prayed for us back in chapter 17, we were lost as lost can be. Jesus Christ was praying that the word that Matthew wrote, the word that Mark wrote, the word that Luke wrote, the word that John wrote, the words that Paul wrote, would be sufficient to reach out, to make songs, to make messages, to make poems, to reach out to touch our hearts. And that we could get saved and that we would get saved, praise God. The difference is when Jesus prayed for us that first time, we were lost as lost can be. This is just saying, I'm glad they're saved, Father God. 
bless their life while they're saved until they get here. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that I can honestly say I was praised for Brother Charlie by Jesus Christ. <laughs> Not just that life would be better, but that I would get saved. He prayed for me that I would be converted, just like he prayed for Peter. And he said to Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. That's what we're supposed to do. Now that we're converted, we need to strengthen the brethren, strengthen our sisters, and especially strengthen the lost. Let them know that there is a heaven. Let them know that there is salvation. Let them know that they can be saved. Let them know that they need to be saved. One of these days, this old crazy world that we live in just ain't going to be here no more. It's going to fold up, blow up, well, blow up, burn up, whichever way you want, whichever term you want to use, it's going to be gone. We're going to be in a place called heaven. We're going to be there with the Old Testament saints, and we're going to be there with the saved of the New Testament. Let's make sure that as many of our friends and family as we can possibly, that they will also be there with them. Okay?
shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Sister Pam, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Thank you.